Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I am your host, Robert Kraft. Thank you all for joining me today. Uh, we have an incredible guest for you, Taylor Schulte. He's from Define Financial. Uh, but first, before we get into our topic of conversation today, which uh, it's going to be wide ranging today. By wide ranging, I mean a lot of surfing and then maybe a little bit of finance. Uh, I digress. Uh, uh, just want to remind everybody, if you haven't already done so, we have our virtual event coming up. SNN Network Virtual Investor Conference. Go to conference.snn.network. We have an incredible speaker lineup, company lineup, just everything under the sun. Um, if you're interested in going and participating, I highly recommend you go and pre-register so you can set up your schedule as to who you want to listen to. Just you know, because it's over four days, so you want to make sure that you uh, customize your schedule as best you can. And uh, also, uh, yeah, again, go to conference.snn.network. And uh, you can also follow me on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. I think that's all the plugs I got so far. So with that, we got Taylor Schulte from Define Financial. Taylor, thank you for joining me today. How are you doing? Good, man. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. It's great to have you on. So um, we're going to start off not with your background and your passion for investing, but I really need to get the backstory on your passion for surfing. I mean, that is your, your, your background picture on Twitter. So we're going to go there first and then, uh, and then, and then we'll, you know, eventually we'll get to investing stuff. So I joke that that picture uh, on Twitter is me before kids. So that's like me hanging on to my youth ah, right there. Gotcha. Um, you know, I, I grew up in San Diego and obviously, you know, really close to the ocean here and I probably didn't start surfing until I was in high school. Um, yeah, just really a hobby more than anything. I'm not super serious about it, but we, uh, we found this little gem, this unknown gem uh, called Nicaragua not too long ago. Um, and this is before Nicaragua got popular. And so we'd go down as a family every single year and we were the only people there surfing world-class waves, absolutely amazing. Um, you know, warm water, no wetsuits, no crowds. And so I got really spoiled. We did that four or five years in a row and then Nicaragua blew up. Um, and now everybody's down there. So we stopped going. I got spoiled. I don't really surf as much anymore. Um, I enjoy playing golf and I've got two kids at home, so I can't really do it all. Um, so that pictures me in my, you know, before kids hanging on to my youth. Um, it inspires me to stay young. Well, I got to tell you, we're about, you know, we might become now surf bros because, okay, not only did I go to undergrad at UCSD, I also know the beautiful amazingness that is Nicaragua. I went on a search trip with one of my best friends back in 2014. And uh, did, do you guys always stay at Playa Colorados? Or where'd you go? We stay right there. Yep. On, on the beach there, there's a surf camp there called Mark and Dave's and that was our spot. Oh, that's so awesome, man. Yeah, I want to yeah. get back so bad, man. You know, it, we, there's always waves and it's always offshore. It's amazing. It's absolutely perfect. Yeah. Once it was discovered by everybody. Yeah. It was kind of sad, but just what a beautiful place. Yeah. The, you know, the minute, the minute I realized I was getting called off waves by other white people, that was uh, <laughs> yeah. when I realized that I think it's been discovered, unfortunately, yeah. but yeah. but the locals are incredible surfers down there. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So cool. They really are. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so anyways, all right. So let's get to investing now. You know, um, what, when and where did your passion for investing then begin? Yeah, I've thought a lot about this and, and a lot of people have asked. Um, I really kind of trace it back to when I was about 12 years old, my grandfather uh, one year decided to give us grandkids uh, some shares of a stock instead of the traditional you know, cash in an envelope or a video game or skateboard wheels or whatever it was. Uh, and this year he gave us uh, shares of a stock, like a physical stock certificate. And uh, I was disappointed, right? I wanted to go buy a, a toy or something like that. But he used that as a tool to teach us about investing and how to look up the stock in the newspaper and what a dividend was. And that stock ended up doing very, very well um, over you know my lifetime or up until I was able to actually touch it. And it uh, helped me purchase my first home. And again, kind of just ingrained in me um, you know, this philosophy around money and investing. And I really just inspired me to pursue a career in finance. The thing is, is like, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. It's not like I got this stock and then I turned, you know, uh, I graduated college. I was like, I'm going to go be a financial advisor. Like, I just didn't really know much about the world of finance, but I think that's what kind of got me going down that track. I always knew I wanted to work in finance and uh, yeah, 22 years old, my first job out of school, I joined Morgan Stanley here in San Diego, uh, you know, passed all my licenses and they just threw me right into the bullpen and I jumped right in. So 
um, that's how I got there. Uh, I just kind of got lucky. I fell into my passion on, on day one, which my wife always, uh, you know, gives me grief for you. Know, so many people struggle to find their, their dream job, but I found it on day one. I mean, I mean, that's amazing. You know, like how did, <clears throat> excuse me, how, how did that opportunity come up to work at Morgan Stanley? Did I mean, you just applied and went for it or like what, what, what exactly happened? Yeah, you know, uh, there were some people in my life uh, that worked in financial services. One of them was a, a good friend's dad who worked at Morgan Stanley and was kind enough to put my resume on the manager's desk and went through the interview process and got the job. Um, so, I, you know, very, very lucky. The other lucky thing, too, is this was in 2007. So it was just before the financial crisis. So, like, I got my foot in the door before things really blew up. Um, not that that made my job much easier now that I had to battle through 08, 09, um, but at least I had a job and, um, you know, they gave us some, some stability through that. Absolutely. So then, so then fill in the gap a little bit. So how long were you yeah. there? And then eventually, you know, when did you, yeah, cause you started to find financial in 2014. So did you, you just put in the time and work there and then, and then that kind of gave you your start at Define? Yeah, I was there for about five years. Um, again, kind of just learning the ropes. Um, had a lot of great mentors there. Look, I mean, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. Um, I would just say that after four or five years, I just kind of got frustrated with how the large publicly traded companies do business in the financial advisory world. Um, you know, their, their, their duty is to the shareholders. Their job is to earn a profit for their shareholders. And it just seemed a little bit backwards to me when I thought our job was to make money for our clients and put our clients first. So, um, you know, that's what they're there for. They're a publicly traded company. And so after about five years, I jumped ship. Um, I took my clients with me. I joined a, a couple different independent firms, kind of bounced around a little bit and just decided it's time to do it my way. I want to put together just, you know, the, the perfect firm. Uh, with the right platform, putting clients first and kind of doing things my way. Both my grandfathers were entrepreneurs. I think I kind of had that entrepreneurial blood inside of me. We didn't have kids yet. My wife was still working. So yeah, in 2014, I'm like, I'm going to do this on my own. And I started my firm. Gotcha. So I, I want to ask that begin when you were building your book, because this is going to, uh, we'll, we'll get to more of your podcast a little bit later, but I'm, I have a feeling this is where you really wet your feet in building that book and, and bringing on clients uh, to work with you. You know, what was that process like at the beginning? And then how did you eventually work your way up to building that book? Yeah. Um, in the beginning, it was really just, I mean, it, this is what we were taught was to just go after and try to talk to people with money and anyone with money, try to get them as a client. Um, you know, it was really a, a sales role in the early days. So it was going through my parents' Rolodex and, you know, cold calling and cold walking and like, you know, everything you could possibly do to just to try to get more and more clients. Um, I quickly learned that, you know, you can't serve everybody, right? You can't do a really good job for every single person on the planet. And so, you know, after five, six, seven, eight years in the business, I realized I need to get much more specialized and I need to really focus on working with the people that I truly do my best work with. And I kind of think about it like the, the legal space, right? Like you're not going to go to an estate attorney to go get a divorce done. And I think our profession is starting to move that in that direction. I think it needs to move in that direction. And so we've gotten really, really narrow uh, to the point where we only work with people over the age 50, over the age of 50 planning for retirement. Um, I don't care if you're 30 years old and you have $20 million, you're just not a fit. Like I just don't know how to properly help that person. I think I'd be doing them a disservice by taking them on as a client. Um, and so we're trying to just stay in our lane and work with the people that we do our best work with um, and then refer out to other specialists when we're not a good fit. So, you know, it's a bit of a learning curve and working with different demographics and different types of clients and trying to figure out who I enjoy working with, who I work best with um, and where my technical skills are, are best used. So that's where we're at today, but it's certainly been a journey to get here. That's pretty, that's pretty interesting that you say it. Cause you know, we were talking offline, you know, I, I've been doing a lot more interviews with uh, wealth advisors and financial planners. And that's been what I've been seeing a lot. Interestingly enough is that each, each planner I've spoken with ha has really been targeting a specific niche, you know, mm -hmm. cause I mean, like anything, you know, you try and be all things to all people and you, you might fall flat, you know, but if you happen to specialize in something, you know, that's interesting to that particular segment. Yeah. And I mean, it really resonates with not just the consumer, but other professionals that are out there. When I sit in front of an estate planning attorney that I've never met before, and I tell them I'm a financial planner and I specialize in working with people over the age of 50 with a million dollars or more, like that's crystal clear. They haven't heard 
they probably haven't heard any financial advisor ever say that. You often hear advisors say, we work with individuals and families and business owners and anybody with money. And, um, you know, it's just right. really hard to, to uh, it just doesn't really resonate with anybody. So when I meet uh, a new professional or a consumer finds us online, we're so crystal clear with what we do and who we do it for, that it makes it much easier for them to make a decision. Um, I mean, we make it really hard for consumers to try and figure out who is a good fit for them to hire when they come to an advisor's website. And again, it looks like they work with everybody. Um, so it certainly helps us as we, we grow our firm, but I also think it benefits the consumer as well. You know what's interesting about the niche that you're going after? Because, you know, I, I, gotta, I gotta compliment you. You know, your, your digital presence is fantastic. You know, you got a great website, you have your own website, you got two podcasts. You know, you're really appealing to that kind of already that next generation. So, I mean, how many conversations do you have where, you know, you've got, I'm 31, you have, you know, in 30s to 40s year old people calling you up saying, hey, you know, I found your podcast. Like, what can you do for me? You're like, ah, well, actually, like, we only work with people over 50 with a million dollars or more. Like, I mean, have you, have you run into that a little bit or has all of your digital marketing strategies really helped just a, really capture some of that audience that you didn't even know had more of an online presence? Yeah, I'll say, first of all, the, the misconception in our industry is that, you know, older people, uh, your baby boomer crowd, uh, you'll hear advisors say that they don't use the internet to find financial services or financial advisors. And that's just completely wrong. Like we hear, you know, you know, daily, weekly from people in that demographic who find us through the podcast, through Google search, um, they're actively searching for advisors online. So that's a misconception in our industry. Um, but no, we don't get 30 year olds reaching out to us because again, our messaging is so clear. It is, um, yeah. If you, I mean, if you, I'm, I'm sure you visit our website, if you go to our website, you're going to be like, okay, I'm in the wrong place. Like this is not where I'm going to be. So you're not going to call us after you see our messaging. Same with the podcast. I'm very clear about exactly who we work with. I'm sure we have 20 year olds and 30 year olds listening to the podcast, but you know, when they hear the content and they hear our call to action, and I explicitly say we work with people over the age of 50 with a million dollars or more who want to delegate this to a professional, they're like, okay, well, that's not me. So, you know, it, it took a long time to get really crystal clear with that messaging and then match that up with all of our different marketing channels. But once you do that, again, it just makes it so much easier on, on everybody to, um, you know, make sure that they're in the right place and nobody's wasting their time. And I just, yeah, it, it's, it's good for everybody all around. Well, let me, let me just say to any of my audience members or anybody listening to us that's 50 or older, please feel free to troll me for that con that comment. I, 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 I do apologize. I know if you were able to find me, then you, you, you're, you know, you know what you're doing. Okay. So, I, <laughs> right. so, so I'll, 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 uh, I'll leave it at that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so then, so let, let's dig into your, your investing philosophy and strategy sure. for, for this target demographic, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, what, how you help uh, these professionals over the age of 50, you know, you're really your target demographic. Yeah. I mean, the first thing I'll say is that we take a very, boring, low cost approach to investing. Um, you know, we believe that uh, in investments, investing, investment management has become commoditized, right? Um, it's very simple for you to go to a Vanguard or a Betterment or a Wealthfront and get a well diversified portfolio at a low cost. Uh, we just don't believe that uh, value can be added through active management. So, um, you know, yeah, we take a very boring, low cost approach. We use uh, low cost index funds, Vanguard style index funds. Uh, we also use dimensional funds and we tilt our portfolios towards small value oriented companies. Um, and then we manage that portfolio for risk by balancing the ratio between stocks and bonds. Um, and then we spend most of our time uh, on the financial planning side of things, the tax planning, the retirement planning, the insurance planning, all those levers that we can pull in your life that we have control over that can literally save somebody hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe even seven figures in some situations. Um, so we just want to make sure the portfolio is, you know, low cost, uh, prudent, backed by academic research, matches up with the client's risk tolerance and risk capacity. And then we focus on all those planning activities. Um, since this is an investing podcast, I'd say one of the more controversial approaches that we take in our portfolio management is that we only own U.S. government bonds and TIPS. We don't own corporate bonds, municipal bonds, high yield bonds. We don't own any of that stuff. 
Um, so we only own US government bonds and tips in the bond sleeve of our portfolio. And that's because we believe that in a globally diversified portfolio, we want a, our, our bond sleeve for our clients to, to truly serve as a safety net. And I think uh, Q1 of this year, proved exactly you know why that works so well um municipal bonds corporate bonds they were down like 10 12 15 percent in q1 of this year when the market when the stock market was melting down when your good old u.s treasury bonds were up i don't know what it was five six seven percent um and so we want that to be our safety net we don't buy u.s government bonds to necessarily make money or improve the rate of return in a client's portfolio. We use it for that safety net. So when things get ugly, we have this war chest that we can tap into uh, to create income for the client while we let the stocks go up and down and take their wild ride. Um, so that's one of the biggest differences that we do. Um, one of our lead planners here actually wrote a, an academic article that was published in the financial, uh, the journal for financial planning on this very topic, comparing government bonds to corporate bonds. The kicker is, um, not comparing them in isolation, but, but comparing them in globally diversified portfolios. And that's where I think most people go wrong. They look at government bonds versus corporate bonds in isolation. They're not looking at them being used in diversified portfolios, which is how we all really invest. Nobody just invests in, in bonds, or most people don't. So forgive my ignorance, because, you know, like I said, I've been doing a lot more recently, a lot more interviews with financial planners, financial advisors. So why is this this topic controversial then? Yeah, I mean, you kind of explained a little bit, but like maybe more holistically, you know, is it is it the fact that there's just no corporate bonds at all in there in these portfolios or is it or is it that, um, you know, maybe some of these portfolios are just one or the other? You know, how, what, what do you mean by that? I just think if you if you pulled a hundred advisors, my guess is a hundred of them, you know, have some form of corporate bonds or municipal bonds in their point. Like, I just don't think anybody has really thought about, well, I shouldn't say that, you know, there are people like Larry Swedro that have written a lot on this topic. He goes as far as to, um, uh, proposing that we should just buy CDs in our, in our bond portfolios. Um, so there are other academics and people out there talking about it. I just don't think most advisors think about it. They'll buy these, you know, mutual funds that are made up with uh, of all different types of bonds. Again, corporate bonds, municipal bonds, high yield bonds. It's just like one big mutual fund made up of all this stuff. And they just don't think about what's inside of some of these funds. And again, I don't think they've actually done the research on comparing the two inside of a globally diversified portfolio. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know why it's controversial other than just most people don't take this approach. Um, I guess some people feel like given where interest rates are at today, I'll hear comments like, um, how can you allocate to treasury bonds with interest rates so low? You know, the returns are essentially guaranteed to be, you know, negative or, you know, very low. And I just say, that's not the reason that we're owning these bonds. Like, again, we have our bonds in the portfolio as a safety net, not to generate additional rates of return. If, if a client needs a higher rate of return, well, then we'll just allocate more uh, to equities. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. It's not wildly controversial. It's just not very common, I guess. I mean, I want, you know, I, I'm not here to stir controversy by yeah. any means, you know, <laughs> but, but I thought that was interesting, you know, that, that it, this is controversial because I know nothing quite frankly. So I, 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 I thought that was kind of cool. Um, yeah. And I would just say, you know, uh, do your own research and put the numbers yes. together, uh, read the, the, uh, academic paper that, that we had published in the journal and come to your own conclusion. But yeah, we're just in the camp that says, Hey, if we need to, if we need a higher rate of return, we'll just take more risk in equities. I'd rather take right. risk there than in the bond market, especially again, like Q1 of this year is just the, the best example ever when these safe municipal bonds are down 10, 12, 14%. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, getting to, to the strategy, you know, when you were like, wh when did the machinations for this start? Was it while you were at Morgan Stanley building your book and you realized like, Hey, most of my clients happen to be in this one niche, you know? So why don't we just start a firm focused on that? Like how, how did you then arrive to this being the niche and, and this and using this strategy? Yeah, that's a good question. When I started the firm, we were still kind of all over the place working with multiple demographics. Um, I had this bright idea I said, look, I'm, I'm young. I, I like working with my peers. Let's start taking on some younger clients and build some youth into the practice. So we went down that path. And again, just kind of realized we can't serve everybody. We had sent out a client communication email one day about disability insurance. And one of my retired clients emailed back and he said, why did I get this email? Like, I'm retired. I don't need disability insurance. And that's when the light bulb went off. I'm like, 
if we're going to serve multiple demographics, then we need to create multiple communication channels and kind of segment our clients out. And, you know, we're a small team of, of four here. Like we just don't have the capabilities. If you're a larger firm and you have more staff, you're able to maybe segment. So I just thought, you know, I'm just really doing a disservice here to, to my clients. And I just, I kind of hit the pause button. This was back in 2017. I hit the pause button on kind of growth for the firm and decided we're going to kind of restructure, get really focused. Um, the clients that aren't really a fit uh, for us to work with, we're going to help transition them, get them in the right hands. Um, we transitioned some of them to another firm in town who specializes in that demographic and just kind of clean things up and then started to move forward again. Um, uh, so yeah, that's kind of what, when the light bulb went off and, and why we made that change. And it's just, I mean, it's just made a world of a difference, especially from a, like a business operation standpoint. I mean, all of our clients look the same, you know, all of our potential clients that walk in there for the most part, they look the same. Um, and it makes things much more streamlined and easy. And again, like we can truly be the expert in serving that demographic. Absolutely. So then I have to ask, you know, we're, we're in a, we're still in the pandemic, you know, things are still just horrible out there. You know, I mean, how has the pandemic caused you to rethink any of your strategy or, or has it at all? Like what, what's the type of calls you've been getting? I'm sure it's been a, uh, Interesting to say the least. Yeah. Um, I don't say this to, to toot my own horn or anything, but we don't really get panic calls like that just because we are so careful about the types of clients that we take on. We, we, we truly make sure that they understand our philosophy and our approach, which is taking a long-term approach. Um, personally, I don't think money should be in the market. Uh, if it's something that you're going to need to touch in the next 10 years, like we're, we're looking even for retirees at age 50 or 60, look, they're going to live until, you know, possibly age 90 or, or more. And so we're planning out for the next 20, 30, 40 years. And we want to take that long-term approach. I personally don't care what happens in the market today or this quarter or, or next year because we're planning out for so long. So um, we didn't really get any panicked phone calls. It was more of like the world's crazy and just kind of wanting uh, someone to kind of talk to and just chat through some things. But um, yeah, I wouldn't say anything's really changed. Obviously we had the CARES Act and the SECURE Act roll out and there were some tax law changes and estate law changes. And that prompted us to um, to make some changes with clients and reach out to some other professionals, update some trusts, um, you know, pause some RMDs, right? RMDs are optional this year. So we can hit pause on those RMDs and save on taxes there. So there's been some opportunities that have crept in on the, on the financial planning and tax planning side of things. But from an investment perspective, you know, nothing's really changed in the way we manage money. Um, I think it's a good test for clients to really confirm that they're in the right portfolio. All right. And Q1 of this year, things got really ugly. And so I always say, this is an opportunity for you to look and say, am I in the right portfolio? How did I feel going through that event? Um, and so if anything, it just gives us a time to reflect, but we've, I mean, we've been banging this drum for so long. Um, I, we constantly scare clients and show them what worst case scenarios look like so that when they happen, we're prepared for them. So, so when you show them those worst case scenarios and then, you know, a worst case scenario like this does happen, you know, like what, what then happens? I mean, do they end up going with that new worst case scenario? They're like, Oh, okay. Let's just play it out because at least I'm not, I had that expectation that this could happen. So, you know, let's just play it out and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, mo most of the comments that we got from clients are, is, you know, you, you told us this could happen. You told us that there are events like this that could happen and the market just doesn't always go up. And we expected something like this to happen at some point. We didn't expect it to be a global pandemic, right? We never know what's going to be around the corner, uh, but they were prepared. So I said, look, we get it. You've been telling us this for years that, that something is probably going to happen. Like, um, yeah, the market doesn't go up every year. So uh, I think it's just a mindset thing that for them to be prepared and acknowledge and say, look, we're taking a long-term approach here. We don't need to panic or, or, you know, think about making any major changes. So again, I don't, I don't, you hear a lot of advisors say like, Oh, my clients never call me. They're not worried or anything. And I would just say um, that's only the case for us because we've been so proactive and we've done so much education with clients over the years. And we've ensured that the clients we do work with share our philosophy. I would never, ever, ever try to convince you to buy into our philosophy. Like if it doesn't make sense to you and it doesn't align with you, totally fine. Like I'm never going to try and sell it to you. Um, so the clients we work with just really understand that and it creates a really good successful relationship. Very cool. So now I want to get into your podcast. So you, you host a few, uh, stay wealthy and experiments in advisor marketing. Can you tell me a little bit about them? 
Yeah. So uh, the Stay Wealthy podcast was born in 2016. It actually started out as a hyper local podcast called Stay Wealthy San Diego, kind of a spin on your Ron Burgundy Stay Classy San Diego. Um, right. And I recognized that I was kind of pigeonholing myself. I wanted to reach a broader audience, right? I was only kind of targeting people here, here locally. So I decided to chop off San Diego, call it kind of rebrand and rename it the Stay Wealthy Podcast um, and get really specific again about like the avatar and who we're talking to, who, who is our ideal audience and crafting all of the, the episodes and content for that exact person. And when I chopped off San Diego, I brought in the reach and I got really specific about the content we're delivering and who we're talking to. The podcast just started to blow up. Now it's an iTunes top 200 investing podcast. We have a super engaged audience. Nice. Um, I absolutely love it. Uh, just very, very smart, really fun listeners that I, I get great emails from and uh, great feedback and I really enjoy it. So for me, I, uh, I have a lot of trouble writing. I don't think I'm a bad writer, but I'm looking at like a blank screen to, you know, write a blog post or an article. It, it's really challenging for me, but there's something weird about just having a microphone and just kind of dictating and talking out loud um, that works really well for me and comes natural to me. So I prefer to educate um, and, uh, and, and create content through voice rather than, than writing or video. Um, and so that's what I've done. So the Stay Wealthy podcast is a retirement podcast for people over age 50, a lot of tax planning, financial planning, investment management type stuff. We've had some great guests on there as well. Um, and then experiments in advisor marketing. Look, um, we've done a lot to grow the firm, mostly through online. Um, consumers find us. We don't really do any active outbound marketing. Um, we just put what I think is really good content out there. We make ourselves very, very visible. I might argue we're one of the most visible firms in San Diego, and we're really not that big compared to some of the other firms that are here. Um, and we've done a lot of things really, really well over the last you know six years since we've we've been here. And I just thought I could help other advisors do something similar. I feel like there's enough business to go around. I can't serve everybody in San Diego or everybody in the country. And I've learned a lot of cool things in the marketing world along the way. And so I started to share what we're doing and what's working and what's not working through the Experiments and Advisor Marketing Podcast and just kind of documenting our journey. And that's been a lot of fun. It's been fun to learn from other advisors and hear what they're doing and what's working on their end. Um, I just really, really enjoy engaging with my peers. Uh, unlike a lot of advisors, I just don't look at them as my my competition. Um, I wouldn't be where I'm at today without other advisors in my life helping me, coaching me, teaching me, mentoring me. Um, and so, um, you know, I want to try and do my part as well. So then uh, my next question would be just to follow up on uh, experiments and advisor marketing. What's some of the best advice or, or some of the things that work the best for you and then also for others that you've seen since you started this podcast? I think two things. I think one, uh, again, people under or advisors underestimate the power of organic Google search and they'll say something like, oh, my clients would never, you know, go to Google and, and, and find me and, and, you know, hand me over a million dollars just to a complete stranger they found on Google. Um, but I'm telling you right now, it is an extremely, extremely powerful place to, uh, to gain new clients and build trust with people. So I think it's just really low hanging fruit. You can do some basic, basic, basic SEO search engine optimization um, things to your website uh, at, to, to just be more visible online. So when someone in your area is searching for a financial planner in San Diego, your name shows up. Um, so it's just like real low hanging fruit that I think too many people underestimate. The second thing is kind of what I mentioned just a minute ago about podcasting, which is I think you have to find the the platform that is most natural and authentic to you i think a lot of people will you know uh start a podcast because podcasting seems like the hot thing to do right oh everyone has a podcast i i better have a podcast uh when a podcasting or voice doesn't really come naturally to them maybe they're a better writer or a better public speaker or they're better on video or you know whatever it might be so i always encourage invi advisors to find the platform that works best for them, that, they, that feels authentic and natural, create content, create valuable content, um, and put it out there on a consistent basis and stop worrying about what everybody else is doing. 
Um, you know, I share the story about an advisor friend of mine who's just, he loves public speaking, like old school public speaking. It doesn't matter if he's speaking to 10 people or 500 people. He just loves it and he's really good at it. It energizes him. And so what he does is he goes and he public speaks and he records that presentation on video. Then he repurposes that as a YouTube video and then he scrapes the audio and he repurposes that as a podcast episode and then it's transcribed into a blog post. And so he gets like all these different forms of content when all he had to do was get up and do something that came natural to him. So I just encourage people to find the outlet that comes natural and feels authentic and just do that and do it consistently and don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Yeah, no, I think uh, Gary Vanderchuk said it best. I, I think I, that's where I saw where he was like, Look, if you're going to create some form of content, make sure you, ha you reformat it for everything because it's available and why not? You know, it only makes sense. Yeah, I would just say, you know, prove to yourself first that you can create the content and do it consistently. You know, don't try to jump ahead and say, okay, I recorded one video. Now I'm going to go try to repurpose it 15 times and go the Gary V way. Um, you know, like, let's start slow here. Commit to, you know, doing a podcast for 12 months and prove to yourself that you can commit to that. And then you can kind of take it up a level and say, okay, now I'm going to try to repurpose this into some different formats. Yeah, there's a lot of false starts out there, unfortunately. Yeah, I think, I think, <laughs> I think advisors try to do too, or anybody really tries to do too much at once. Like, you know what? I'm finally going to get into social media marketing. Okay, they go open up a Twitter and a LinkedIn and a Facebook and a TikTok account, all this stuff. It's like, you can't, you can't do all those things really, really well. So find one platform and own it and get really good at it. Dude, I got to ask you this because this is something that's been kind of bothering me lately that I've been seeing on LinkedIn and screw it. We're going down to social media. Let's, let's do a social media jam. This will be fun. I'm in. All right. So on LinkedIn, I've been seeing a lot of people that I follow. It looks like they out of nowhere are now, like I know the real ones that actually post their own thoughts and like their own you know, axioms and stuff like that based on experience and whatnot. But I've been seeing a lot of like that similar formatting where it's like, you know, one line of, you know, I can't even think of an example off the top yeah. of my head, but you know what I'm trying to say where, it, and then it turns into like, and then this one person inspired me to do this. And like, I know these people like, like save it, you know, like, <laughs> you know, you're, you're not Mr. Or Mrs. You know, like uh, uh inspirational here. Like, yeah. like, I mean, are, are there people, is there like a market for people hiring them to write these like LinkedIn nut jobby weird things? Like it, it like it, it to the point where I've almost like gotten off LinkedIn because it bothers me so much. I don't know. Have you been seeing that? Yeah, I, I totally hear you here. Um, and there are tons of these LinkedIn marketing services that charge thousands of dollars a month, um, you know, and guarantee leads and engagement, all this stuff. Um, Here's what I say to your comment, because I hear so many people make that comment and say, LinkedIn's a mess, and I get so many spam messages and people wanting to connect with me and sell me stuff. And um, to me, that presents just a giant opportunity because oh, most sure. people use LinkedIn improperly. They don't use it very well, which means if you use it well, you're going to stand out from everybody else. Be like, oh, wow, like Taylor's posts are really interesting and engaging and vulnerable and personal. Like, I like following Taylor. And um, and so I think it's just much, much easier to stand out on LinkedIn because it is kind of a chaotic mess. Uh, so I think there are some really good best practices. One of the things is um, looking at LinkedIn like you might a Facebook, right? Like some of my most engaged posts on LinkedIn are like pictures of my family. And I might tie it back to business a little bit, but you'd be surprised. Again, it just, it just stands out. It just looks so much different. And I think getting personal and vulnerable on this business platform can actually work really well. Uh, so I think right. just most people don't use it correctly. They turn to kind of these spammy approaches that don't work very well. Um, I do think that there's something to be said for creating some space in your posts and you'll see really good marketers do this, right? Nobody wants to read like this big chunk of text. It's just not really pleasing on the eye. So there's something about kind of the formatting of a That's post. Yeah, yeah, but um, but the content itself, you know, needs to be high quality. Again, I think getting personal and vulnerable and just getting real with people presents a huge opportunity. The last thing I'll say is um, LinkedIn may not be where your target demographic lives. And you have to be really, really honest with yourself here. Um, our demographic doesn't live on LinkedIn. I don't use LinkedIn to try and grow my firm. Um, so there might be an opportunity on LinkedIn, but your demographic might not live there. So uh, just take that into consideration before you go all in on one of these social media platforms. 
All right, let's break down each platform then. For let, I'm going to throw out some some potential like what you're looking to get, you know, and let's let's figure out which platforms will fit for you. So let's say you know let's say you're a wealth advisor that's targeting you know more retail investors that have done very well but now are looking to kind of place their money with an advisor because they just you know they made their money but now they want to you know make sure that they have you know their safety net and their safety blanket and they're and they're really watching out like should they go on twitter or, or facebook you know what's some of the best platforms for all these different niches that that advisors are going for yeah um I would probably start with age as a, as a screener, right? Um, that's probably the easiest. Now, if you have a really tight niche, like one of my good friends, he specializes in working with speech language pathologists, right? So that gives the opportunity to get really like, where, wow. <laughs> where do speech language pathologists hang out, right? Well, come to find out they hang out on Instagram, not because of their age or their profession. It just seems to be like, that's where the profession hangs out. They share fun images and resources and, and templates and stuff with each other. Um, so unless you have a really tight niche like that, I would think about it from an age perspective first. Um, I think LinkedIn is great for your, let's call it like your Gen X crowd, like your high earning 30, you know, late 30s, 40 year olds, um, making good money, they have professional jobs, lawyers, doctors, engineers. I think that's a great platform for that demographic. Not so much for your baby boomer retiree, right? So our clients, most of them live on Facebook. So that's where we do most of our social media marketing because most they mostly live on Facebook. I also know that they like to read publications like AARP or Kiplinger. Um, so I regularly write for Kiplinger.com, which again is where a lot of my demographic lives. Um, I think Twitter is a phenomenal platform for sure for like a younger millennial demographic. But I also think it's a great place to network with media and journalists. Um, you know, I, I've, I've, I've met a ton of people there. I've had opportunities for, for television and being quoted. Um, so I, I use Twitter for media, journalists, and networking with other, other financial advisors. I don't use it for any sort of marketing purposes. So that's how I think about it. I think if you are working with a younger demographic, um, I don't know if, if TikTok's going to get banned here or not. It's definitely a, a front page of the news right yeah. now. But I do think there's an opportunity on TikTok. It's such a creative, unique platform. Um, if you do target that younger demographic, there's a lot of bad financial advice being given on there right now. And so I'm craving for, for somebody to go on and do something really fun and creative on that platform. Dude, I've been thinking about it nonstop wanting to get on TikTok. And then, but like, then I feel like a boomer and I'm looking at just like, well, it's yeah. going, I don't even know <laughs> what to do do with this um, yeah you know the same way yeah yeah like i want to in the worst way but it, i just don't know what to do well i think that goes back to you know what what feels right and authentic to you like if you try and force it it's not going to work or do anything but right. if it just feels like the platform that's calling your name i think you can yeah i think there's a huge opportunity there so yeah you know just like i think the hardest part for most people is identifying who is their avatar? Who is their ideal client? Like, what is their exact age? What is their net worth? Where do they live? Um, you know, you try to get as, like, as granular as possible. And then once you have that person kind of outlined, then you can say, okay, where does this per person hang out? How do they like to consume content? Where do they consume content? Do they use social media? And that'll drive a lot of your marketing activities and make it much easier. But most people want to skip that first step because they have a hard time owning, owning that demographic or owning a niche. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, trust me right now and everything you're saying I, for a, for a financial media company, I'm, I'm, I'm asking those questions constantly. You know, I mean, it, this is, a, this is important stuff, no matter whether you're a financial advisor, financial media, whatever company you're in, like the world in, in terms of marketing is totally on digital and you have to start yep. really thinking about who you're, what the customer journey is, what they're thinking about, how they consume that data, that content, or just want to consume whatever it is that you are providing out there. You know, you yep. just, you have to really think a lot more about that. And, there, and you're right. There are so many ways to stand out on some of these, on, on these platforms. The LinkedIn one, especially just was, it's just been bothering me so bad. Like, yeah. you know, like, ah, it's, so, it's just frustrating, man. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah. I'm one of the rare people. Like I, I actually like LinkedIn. Like I like, Oh, I love it. That, yeah. I, I actually legitimately love LinkedIn. It's just, there's a few on there that I, that I'm connected with that like, I can't unconnect with, but I just, I still, I, it's like a hate follow. It's like, oh, yeah. I hate <laughs> stupid post. Like what ridiculous shit are they going to post today? Yeah. Part of my French. I'm sorry. Everybody. All right. Hey, it's so, your podcast. This is true. 
<laughs> All right. So, so with that, what, what, what investing experience would you say has impacted you the most in your career thus far? Investing experience, personal or, or in my profession? Uh, both, if, if you got time. Um, I think for myself, so when I, when I first joined Morgan Stanley and I got my licenses and I got my cubicle, um, I was able to like to, to purchase securities, right. For, for myself, um, you know, I had some money saved up and this was, like I said, in, in late 2007 and some wholesaler convinced me to put, you know, at that time was a pretty large sum of money in this fund that I really knew nothing about. Um, and then of course, 08, 09 is right around the corner. And I lost half my money in, in no time. And that was just a good, good lesson for me um, because when I joined the firm, everyone was just screaming bull market and everyone's making money. And again, I'm 22 years old. I don't know any better. I don't even know what a recession is. And so I thought it was just a really good experience to lose money right away. And I always say that like when somebody goes and opens up their own brokerage account, you know, Robinhood trading account, whatever, like the best thing that could happen is that they lose money right away because they just quickly learn that again, the market doesn't always go up. They're not some sort of genius that, you know, every idea they have is not going to result in a profit. The worst thing that could happen is they make a ton of money right out of the gates and they think that they're a genius. So um, that was a good lesson for me early on professionally in the middle of the great recession in 08, 09, one of our clients called and he said, if I don't sell, this is the bottom of the market in March of 09. He said, if I don't sell everything today, if I don't have you sell all of my investments today, my wife is going to leave me. And that's when this became really more, more than a job for me and more than just like managing some investments. Like this is somebody's life um, that we're dealing with here. And so that was a really just good reminder that we're dealing with more than just somebody's money. Um, and that's when I really got excited about financial planning, the behavioral side of things, the academic side of things. Um, but that's something that just always stuck with me to this day was just that person calling me and, and telling me that. Well, that's so heavy. I mean, I, what do you do in that? Like, yeah, sure. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. I don't know what you can do other than educate and try to talk through, you know, different solutions, but yeah, that, that was a big one. Oof. Oh man. I, I don't, I, I don't envy you in that situation. That's really scary. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then what, what advice do you have for, for new investors out there? Well, you know, again, I, I do think there's something to be said for exploring and experimenting, um, you know, making some stupid investments, losing money. Uh, I, I think it's really impactful. I think um, making mistakes is a really good thing. So I'd say, yeah, get out there and, and, and try some different things and uh, try to create your own investment philosophy, right? Learn from others, read books. Um, you know, everyone's going to develop their own philosophy and approach. And I would encourage everybody to do that. Even if you ultimately end up hiring a financial advisor to take it off your shoulders, I th I, there's a lot to be said. I'd say most, I'd say just about every single one of our clients is, is very smart and knowledgeable about money and investments and finance. They could be doing it themselves. It's just that they'd rather spend their time doing something else. Like they just want to delegate and hand this off to somebody else. So I think there's a lot of power in understanding how things work, having that experience, go get your feet wet, make some mistakes. Um, but yeah, I also think, you know, it, my philosophy and approach, like low cost index funds, broad based market indexes, you know, I'd rather own 12,000 securities than 12 securities. Like that's my approach to things. So my advice for a new investor would just be, you know, go buy a couple of Vanguard index funds, keep things simple, and then focus on making more money and saving more money. Because I believe that that's more impactful while you're young than trying to find the best investment. Um, especially you know, when you have time on your side and you let the magic of compounding returns play out making more money and saving more money is going to be way more impactful than trying to pick the best international fund or, you know, should I have 5% in emerging markets or 10%? Um, so that'd be my advice for, for people starting to get into this. Well, with that, where can my audience go and find more information about you and Define Financial and all your podcasts, of course. Sure. Yeah. I mean, kind of my main hub for everything is just taylorsulte.com. So my name, uh, but you can learn more about my firm by going to definefinancial.com. All of our contact information is there. You can learn more about. We've got a blog. We, we write a ton of content. And um, yeah, everything, everything lives there. Well, Taylor, thank you so much for joining me today, man. That was so much fun. And uh, I'm excited for our next, uh, next chat down the road. <laughs> Thanks so much, Robert. Appreciate you having me on. Thank you.